Hello, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to our COMMIT webinar on preparing refugee youth for a settlement, the role of pre-departure orientation. My name is Geertre Lando. I work at the IOM regional office in Brussels and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Be very happy to see so many participants amongst us to join us um, for this COMMIT webinar. And of course, uh, we hope it will be an interesting session for all of you. So today we are going to discuss about um, preparing refugee youth for a settlement because indeed um, young refugees are a very uh, specific target group under a settlement with specific needs that we can already address at the pre-departure stage through pre-departure orientation. So today we're going to hear uh, experiences from different colleagues who have worked on providing pre-departure orientation for refugee youth. Um, we have as speakers today, um, first of all, Laurence Hart, who is the director of the IOM Coordination Office for the Mediterranean, who will uh, give us the opening remarks. After that, we'll hear from Bindu, who's a project coordinator for a settlement and integration at IOM UK, and she will tell us about the UK's experience in um, preparing a curricula for uh, youth pre-departure orientation and implementing this. And finally, we'll hear also experiences from the ground. We will hear both from Talar and uh, Crystal based in Beirut, who have experience in delivering pre-departure orientation training for refugee youth um, and children. And then last but not least, this webinar is also the occasion to launch our new COMMIT publication, which is a handbook on um, training refugee youth. So basically, this is a tool for anyone who's looking at uh, organizing pre-departure orientation for youth uh, that are going to be uh, resettled um, or relocated. Um, it's a tool that we developed under COMMIT. Um, COMMIT is a regional project funded um, by DG Home under the Asylum Migration and Integration Funds that seeks to um, promote the integration of refugees uh, uh, that are um, resettled um, to Europe. Now, while the project focuses uh, specifically on resettlement, of course, uh, the pre-departure orientation for youth can also be relevant in other contexts. And we are particularly thinking now uh, of the case of relocation as also um, we are planning um, upcoming relocation movements from unaccompanied minor children from Greece to other EU member states. So we hope this webinar and the tool that we'll present uh, can be useful to many of you in the different contexts you're working with refugee youth. Um, now, I would like to ask all participants to also um, engage with the panelists. So if you have any questions, any comments, please do feel free to use the chat function. Um, so in the chat function, you can ask your questions, kindly click all panelists, and then all of us will receive your questions. As we go through the webinar, I will also invite our panelists to address uh, your questions. So please don't hesitate to use the chat function. Um, now with this, I would like to invite uh, Lawrence Hart, uh, Director of the IOM Office in Rome, to take the floor for the opening remarks. Thank you. Good morning, Hertha. Can you hear me? Just to check that we're all... Yes, Lord. I can good. hear you well. Good, good. And good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, wherever you're sitting uh, in the world. Uh, I'm very pleased to, um, to open this, uh, this webinar, this uh, exchange uh, between experiences uh, and to see what works what needs to be improved in such a in such a delicate context as, as you mentioned commit uh, is a um, two-year regional project uh, maybe there's a slide uh, Rabab right uh, if you can project slide number two um, just to give you an introduction uh, to the program it's two-year regional project involving Croatia, Italy, 
Portugal and Spain, so four different uh, contexts, uh, or although geographically quite uh, quite close, and that's also a, a an important element because of similarities. We have to also draw upon similarities. Commit a response to the um, uh, AMIF uh, 2017 call for proposal on integration of third country nationals, and within the priority three. Uh, there is a specific reference to the importance of pre-departure and post-arrival support for the integration of persons in need of international protection who are being resettled from a third country, including through volunteering services. Um, next slide, uh, where it says project objectives. I can't see the slide, but I trust it is being projected. Um, so uh, you you see here in the slide that there are three uh, specific objectives. Uh, first of all, the overarching one is to facilitate the integration of resettled refugees by strengthening the linkages between uh, pre-departure and post-arrival support. Uh, often in the past, there was uh, pre-departure uh, orientation and then in the host country, in the host community was post-arrival support, but not necessarily with a link or with a continuum between the two. And I think the value is exactly there, creating that continuum. Now, the program obviously is specific, has a specific focus on vulnerable groups, such as young refugees and women, uh, which are a specific uh, caseload and need specific addressing specific issues. Um, the specific objectives of this, of this program is to enhance the pre-departure um, orientation activity. So, uh, enabling those contacts at an early stage between the refugees and the communities of destination before the departure, uh, as well as uh, addressing those specific needs of the vulnerable groups, so that everyone is prepared and everyone has an expectation and see that, that their expectation is being taken care of, not necessarily addressed, but taken care of. The second element of uh, this program is to systematize the community support in in the receiving communities uh, by uh, building the capacities of local actors and piloting mentorship schemes why is this, is this important because no one uh, unless has a a long-standing experience of resettlement uh, the the, uh, the the expertise is built upon of course direct uh, experience, but also at the same time by learning from others how things are being done, and they, hence the, the importance of this element. And the third one, exactly, is to foster those transnational exchanges among the countries of resettlement to identify and disseminate the lessons learned and the uh, best practices. Next slide, uh, which is uh, the one that I uh, will conclude my remarks on is the purpose of this webinar. So this is a second of a series of four uh, on which address cross-cutting themes, uh, which characterize the resettlement continue and specific needs of these uh, resettled uh, population. Um, so it's looking at uh, migration and health along the uh, resettlement continuum, mainstreaming gender, into pre-departure orientation and looking at uh, labor market integration, which is also another key concern for many people uh, venturing into a new life uh, as a resettled person. Um, now, I think also the purpose is to look at the, uh, uh, as I was mentioning, it's important to build upon the expertise, the experience, the do's and don'ts that uh, those countries with a longer tradition in the implementation of uh, resettlement programs have accumulated over time and look at those good practices in in order to better support the integration of resettled refugees i think the underlying and i will i will conclude with uh, with this i think the underlying question is how do we accelerate the integration process Acceleration is important for a number of reasons. First of all, because it goes to the benefit of both the host country and the host community and the resettled people. Uh, 
by reducing some vulnerabilities, but also empowering the, the resettled person to be part uh, of the new community and being feeling uh, with a sense of contribution to the new community. How can I contribute to that community? I think it was for me personally, and this is a personal anecdote, it was very eye-opening when I went to Canada once and I saw a recently resettled Sudanese um, a Sudanese resettled person waving his new um, Canadian passport. And he said, well, I feel Canadian. I'm Canadian and I feel that I want to contribute to this new community and I'll do my best to contribute to this new community. I think that was a very eloquent statement um, that that person made. And I'm sure there are others that, that can, can make that statement or are willing to make that statement. Uh, I think one of the elements that we have to always uh, take into account is exactly this acceleration process because the acceleration process makes makes it makes the resettled person not just a beneficiary but an actor of development but of contribution to the new host society and community so i leave that question how can we further accelerate this process in in our uh, activities in our host communities in our countries and uh, of course this webinar is exactly intended for that to share that experience in order to um, speed up this this process thank you very much for your attention and i wish you a very good uh, exchange of ideas thank you very much lawrence for your opening um, remarks and for introducing the commit project and indeed you're very right to point out that um, integration of resettled refugees is a two-way process which involves of course the refugees themselves but also the host um, communities and for a settlement to be a successful experience it's important that both the refugee and the host community are prepared for this so we hope that the webinar will shed a bit more light on this. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So as I already um, explained, we are going to focus this webinar on how to prepare refugee youth for a settlement, particularly looking at the importance of pre-departure orientation. Now, as a first speaker, we'll hear from Bindu, who's a project coordinator on resettlement and integration at IOM London, and she will tell us a bit more about the experiences of the UK on um, cultural orientation or pre-departure orientation, and then specifically the experience of developing pre-departure orientation for children and youth. So, Bindu, very happy that you could join us. I can already see you. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you, Hedra. And um, thank you for the really helpful introduction, uh, Lawrence. Um, I'm very delighted to be here to share a little bit about our experiences in the UK of developing the UK cultural orientation specifically tailored to children. Um, a little bit in terms of the background about uh, on how we went about developing this and the commitment to actually develop bespoke orientation for children. Um, so, Rabab, if you can go on to the next slide, please. The next one. Thank you. Yeah. So, basically, in terms of a background for the UK cultural orientation for children, we were, of course, very much driven by the needs of the resettlement program and the launch of the Vulnerable Children's Resettlement Scheme presented IOM UK with a very unique opportunity, in fact, to develop child-friendly materials and curriculum um, that would be able to prepare children for resettlement. And why did we go about doing this? Why did we uh, think that we needed a specific tailored bespoke curriculum for children? The reason behind it was um, very early on in the resettlement program, UNHCR and IOM were very interested in identifying the integration outcomes for refugees that had been resettled to the UK at the very start of the program. And we found that children and young people were disproportionately affected by the conflict in Syria. They had very um, strong and clear integration needs, and they had very clear information needs about preparing themselves for life in the UK. We often find that children are at the forefront of integrating very quickly because they go to school, they pick up languages, 
they are able to um, help in many ways steer the entire family's integration sometimes in the host country. But equally, they're also left behind in many instances in, in terms of their ability to access education within the resettlement country due to language barriers or having missed education. There are lots of um, challenges that many of them can face in um, upon resettlement and in, in integrating. And this was where we felt it was really important to look at the principles that were there, very specifically in the UNCRC, whether it's the articles on the right to information or the right to education, and, and somehow enshrining it within the broader principles of the SDGs of making sure that no one is left behind. That was primarily the intention in making sure that we develop resources across the age groups who are um, being resettled and prepared for um, cultural orientation um, pre-departure. So that's that's a little bit about the background. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, Rava. So um, we went about doing this um, collaboratively. We felt that it's something that we needed to reach out to the broader IOM family, first of all, to understand from other programs programs that had actually developed resources. So for instance, the uh, Canadian orientation abroad or the Norwegian orientation or Australian orientation or the US orientation programs. All of these programs had different levels and different kinds of uh, ways in approaching um, the preparation of children and young people to um, prepare them for life in, in, in their resettlement countries. After having looked at all of this, we felt that it would be good to also look at partnerships within the UK. Um, I must emphasize at this point, we were very strongly supported by the UK Home Office, who showed a very strong commitment um, and invested resources in developing these bespoke curriculum. And through a competitive process, we identified the British Council as a partner to help us develop a lot of these resources. And while IOM was looking at developing resources in partnership with the British Council, so looking at trainer manuals and resources and techniques for delivering and engaging children, we also had the Home Office working quite closely with uh, the House of Illustration, who basically helped develop a suite of resources, primarily two books, which were illustrated with through workshops with children. So the idea was not just to consult with children, and hear their views, but also to involve them in the preparation of the materials themselves, so that children, in a way, are speaking to children in the pre-departure orientation. And we found this approach to be very beneficial, the idea of working across um, different um, uh, agencies, whether it was the Home Office or the British Council or House of Illustration, and um, school children themselves um, to, to actually come, come up with a varied set of resources so we had bespoke trainer manuals that were prepared for the ages of 5 to 9, 10 to 13, and 14 to 18. And um, Talad, my colleague, will elaborate a little bit about um, how we developed uh, the teaching resources for these um, age groups. We, we felt that we can't just use a one-size-fits-all. We can't just say anyone under the 18 gets, gets the same curriculum. So we actually broke it down into different age groups, trying to understand what would be the information needs for each of these age groups. What might be the priority messages? So the messages that we give a five to nine year old are not the same as the messages that we would give a 14 to 18 year old. So we and the techniques that we use in, in delivering these messages would also need to be adapted. So that was why we went about um, uh, creating bespoke manuals for each of these three age groups. And we developed age appropriate journals and picture books. And some of these resources were developed again by children for children. The reason we developed these journals is because we felt that there would be an ongoing and continuous engagement with the messages developed uh, for pre departure orientation, even post arrival. We felt that this would be a good link for children to mark their transition, to look at their hopes and dreams and their aspirations for resettlement. So um, these were the set of resources that we developed. But we also felt that it, in addition to this, there was a group of um, unaccompanied asylum seeking children that were looking, uh, that the UK was looking to transfer through the Section 67 Immigration Act, which allowed for children to be brought into the UK um, uh, from within Europe. But equally, we also had unaccompanied children coming in through the resettlement program. 
So we had multiple routes through which the UK uh, had made a commitment to pro offering protection to children in need. And within the cohort of unaccompanied children that were coming through the resettlement program, we felt that there was an opportunity to facilitate contact to reduce some of the anxiety around resettlement for these children with their social workers or foster carers here in the UK. So in addition to the orientation program that they received, which uh, my colleague Talar will uh, elaborate a little more about, there were also phone calls that we facilitated, video calls, which helped children connect with the foster carers and social workers to help them understand a little more and prepare better and hear directly from their support workers or their social workers or the foster carers about the kind of support that they would get in the UK. And we found that this was very helpful and reassuring to the children. Um, next slide, Rabab. And so, um, again, to just reiterate what were the objectives um, in, in um, developing the cultural orientation, but also in the delivery of cultural orientation. So all of our trainers in um, the pre-departure context are very keen to ensure that the way in which we develop and deliver the um, orientation provides children with the information in an accessible format. The primary goal of de delivering cultural orientation for children was to reduce a lot of their anxiety, to help them understand that there is a safe space within which to learn, to acknowledge that children have the right to protection as enshrined in the UNCRC, um, and that they uh, are rights holders by themselves, and to introduce child-friendly material within a broader safeguarding framework, because we felt that there needs to be an understanding of their own agency, their own autonomy within the broader protective frameworks, whether it's the UK legislation framework, or whether it's the framework um, given to all of us under the UNCRC. The idea also is to communicate the key priority messages that we agreed on with the Home Office to ensure that children understand what life in the UK will look like, what are their rights, what are their responsibilities, and what are the freedoms that they enjoy. And all of this to be communicated in an age-appropriate manner, but also using child-friendly and participatory techniques. Um, the next slide, Rabha. So the key considerations in, in, in um, driving us to develop age-appropriate methodologies and to ensure that the techniques were used um, were participatory and child-centered were that we felt that young people and children will learn best when they're engaged and when they're doing. So there was a lot of emphasis on activity, there was emphasis on play, and there's also an emphasis on reflection. So if there was an activity, we would always have a little bit of a debrief to try and understand um, what did children feel, what did they think about it. We also recognized very early on as we were developing the curriculum and, and thinking about the suite of resources that children will come from varied backgrounds and they will come from varied levels of awareness about their rights, about their understanding of resettlement, but also in terms of their levels of literacy and uh, their socioeconomic backgrounds. We also realized that within a resettlement context, children will not have attended school continuously. There is a disruption in their education. And there is also a possibility that they might have stopped going to school altogether because of no access in their host countries. So there might be an unfamiliarity with, say, a classroom setting. So we felt that there was a need to understand that these might be challenges that children will bring with them, but they were also opportunities for us to then innovate and think out of the box in terms of the resources that we developed. Um, and at all times, whether it's the adult curriculum or the children's curriculum or the young people's curriculum, we've always, as IOM, made sure that we place an emphasis on preliterate populations, understanding that not everyone might be able to read or write. And therefore, we created activities that would allow the whole class or the whole group to actually be engaged and to participate. And um, <clears throat> my colleague Talar and uh, Crystal, who, who will be presenting after me, will be able to guide you through some of these um, considerations and, and show you how we actually use them in the classroom. Um, at this point, I'm going to pause and um, pass on to, to, to my colleagues. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Bindu, for uh, giving us the background on how you went about developing the curricula for allora. youth PDO and children's PDO. Uh, Lawrence, can you kindly switch off your microphone? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so excellent, Bindo, and I'm very pleased to hear also how actually, you know, many of the resources were designed by children for children so that you actually involved, you know, refugee children also in the design of your um, information and training materials. Um, that's excellent. And of course, good to hear that the focus remains, you know, on playing, on activities, of course, with a necessary reflection, not to forget that, you know, many of, you know, the refugee children might not have been able, you know, to, to go to school, um, might not be able to read and write. Um, so very good to hear that you took all of that into consideration. Now, I would like also to ask um, all participants uh, to use the chat function if you have any questions for Bindu at this point. Um, feel free to ask. Um, I see a first question here, which is um, how long did it take to develop all the materials? <laughs> Indeed, very good question, because I see you went, you know, with, uh, you know, different materials for different age groups. Um, I, I can imagine, you know, it took a while to develop this. How long did that take in you? So we basically started thinking about uh, developing these materials way back in uh, 2016. And um, it took a few months for us to go through the approval process and everything. And we spent the bulk of 2017, the latter half in 2018, actually commissioning uh, different um, organizations to actually develop these resources. So I would say it took us about um, six to nine months in basically developing all of these curriculums. And then we also developed training to help our trainers deploy the curriculums because we felt that that was a very important component as well because it's important to use child-friendly techniques and uh, so in addition to this we had a train the trainer where uh, we uh, developed the training to actually help our trainers deliver the curriculum Okay, thank you very much, um, Bindu. Uh, there is another question from another participant asking if uh, we can find uh, those um, materials. Um, well, in any case, uh, I can already inform you that um, many elements have also been incorporated in the COMMIT um, handbook on training refugee youth. Uh, my colleague Rabab already shared in the uh, chat function, uh, the link to the website, uh, the IOM regional office website, where you can um, find this handbook. We will also share that link again later on uh, when we will um, present the handbook. So uh, please do consult that. Um, I'm seeing a lot of other questions coming in. Um, do you always have a specific trainer from the UK implementing the children's um, and youth PDO, Bindu, is it someone from the UK or how, how does this go? Yeah, so um, we've always used um, our trainers who are based in the region, who have uh, an experience of delivering um, across different cultures. So we call them cross-cultural facilitators in some contexts and in other contexts, they are essentially individuals who are able to use uh, intercultural competencies and have been trained to help participants understand a little more about the different cultures that they are uh, they're trying to introduce them to. So we use trainers in the region for uh, the UK program uh, up until the 31st of March 2020. The program was primarily focused on the Middle East and North Africa. So Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq and Egypt. And our trainers in all of these countries were trained to deliver they are all uh, proficient in Arabic and many of them speak additional languages as well that the refugees speak. When needed, we used interpreters, but majority of the caseloads that came through the program were Arabic speaking. And therefore, we used trainers from the region who knew the language and were able to communicate quite effortlessly and have also been able to travel to the UK, understand the context and present this to the children. So yeah. there's a lot of, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Bindu. So indeed, you're using a cross-cultural facilitator, so trainers who speak the language of the children, but who have been to the UK to understand uh, the context. Thank you for answering um, that. Uh, there is another question um, asking um, if um, how long the children's and youth PDO classes for the UKCO last. Can you tell us a bit more about that, Bindu? Yeah, absolutely. So when we designed the curriculum, we actually designed it with a lot of hours um, of mileage. Uh, from it because we felt that we were making an investment. So in terms of the curriculum content, we have about 10 of teaching material. The reason we did that was not because the delivery of UKCO for children is for 10 hours. It's primarily for two hours spread across two days. So an hour each for each of the age groups. Um, the reason we have 10 hours of, of teaching material is because we felt the trainers should have a suite of resources that they can actually dip into based on the group that they're teaching. So we developed extensive resources that can be adapted to a two hour slot. So one hour each day. So in terms of the delivery, it's two hours, but there's a suite of resources. But my colleague Talar will actually be able to tell you a little more about it. I don't want to dip into her presentation. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK, so we'll have to wait for Talat to tell us a bit more on um, how this goes. Um, now, there is another question that came in, if you would actually have some examples of peer education, so children teaching each other. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, uh, again, Talar, my colleague in her presentation will actually allude to it. But um, for us, it was very important. So the way in which we conceived this was basically to ensure that children here in the UK had an opportunity to, to interact with uh, uh, children overseas. Now, we were not able to do this in a physical format due to various considerations, safeguarding being one of the most primary ones. But what we felt is there was definitely an opportunity for us to create a link through resources. So we created activities through which children could speak to each other. The books themselves that were developed by House of Illustration are a very good example of this because children in the UK actually sat down and thought about what it is that they want to tell children who are coming to the UK. And all of the illustrations reflect that. So they have things about, you know, food, about uh, favorite activities, things like that. We, uh, young people wanted to say, I want to tell them about the music. I want to tell them about my, uh, a day in my life. So you'll see that these resources developed by the Home Office and the House of Illustration actually are um, capture this, uh, this peer education. OK, thank you. Thank you, Bindu. Very nice uh, to hear that. Um, uh, I have another question. Um, do you have three guides? So three, three, three guides, three uh, resource um, materials, one for each age group. Is that correct? Yes. So we have three trainer manuals, five to nine, a trainer manual in English and Arabic, um, 10 to 13, trainer manual in English and Arabic, and then 14 to 18, trainer manual in English and Arabic. In addition to this, we have journals, again, for each of the age groups, so the 5 to 9, 10 to 13, and 14 to 18. We also have, in addition to this, the two illustrated books for the 5 to 9 and 10 to 13 age group, and it can be even given to the 14 to 18. Okay, uh, good. Uh, another question here, a very interesting question. Um, have you ever done an evaluation of the youth PDO with the participants? Um, if so, what was their feedback? Um, how did I find um, the PDO helpful and uh, were there perhaps any gaps, any teams or topics that I felt um, were missing and that I wished, you know, should be included in the, in the curriculum? Yeah, so we haven't had an official evaluation that we've done of the uh, children and young people's uh, curriculum once it was deployed. It was deployed in uh, the summer and um, autumn of uh, 2018. So we've been at, uh, delivering this for over a year now. And we are keen to hear from children, but we've always had anecdotal feedback. And Talar will share some of those quotes with you from children themselves on, on you know, their experience of receiving the cultural orientation. What we did um, in the past few months, along with UNHCR and UNICEF, was we spoke to young people and there's a publication out called refugee and then 
it speaks to the experience of unaccompanied children who have uh, come into the UK and, and subsequently sought protection. This publication captures varied experiences. There's some indication there where you can find a little bit of information on children actually emphasizing that they want to know more, they want to be prepared, not just pre-departure, but also post-arrival, mm -hmm. that they want curriculums that help them understand. So children are not saying, you know, I want a class or I want a curriculum. What they're saying is that I want to know more and I want somebody to spend time explaining this to me and I want to interact with other young people. So there's definitely um, evidence that there is a need for investment on this, but I don't have an evaluation document exclusive to the UK cultural orientation. Mm -hmm. But we're keen to hear, and we would yeah. be looking at something like that in collaboration with the Home Office. Yeah, yeah. Resources and time yeah. committing. The publication you mentioned sounds very interesting. Um, could you perhaps uh, share a link to the publication in, in the chat yes. for all participants? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. I can do that. Give me a yes. couple of minutes. Okay, thanks. And then there is a final contribution from a cooperative that would like to do work um, on resettlement in Italy. Um, who should we contact to start? Um, well, perhaps I can invite you to reach out to the colleagues of um, IOM um, Rome to, to provide you further um, guidance. Um, good colleagues, uh, I think with this Bindu, we will indeed move on to hear from Talar and Crystal, who have both been engaged uh, with the youth and the children to provide a pre-departure orientation. Talar, Crystal. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you, Bindu, and welcome all. Well, um, to add on what Bindu actually highlighted, um, can we move to the second slide, please? Thank you. Now, as Bindu had mentioned, uh, the UK child CO sessions uh, were rolled out in uh, Beirut and Jordan um, around July 2018, and it was a pilot phase. Uh, of course, after a lot of uh, trainings and the trainers who were going to deliver the child CO when we went to the UK we had hands-on experience to actually get familiarized with the material that was developed and uh, so basically as Bindu also mentioned uh, the child CO uh, the child PDO basically is divided into three different age groups 5 to 9 10 to 13 and 14 to 18 and uh, all three age groups have their own training materials which can be adapted in the classroom depending on class size also under the number of children and their literacy levels. Um, so as uh, trainers, we went to the UK and also experienced these uh, activities ourselves to see how they can be implemented in the classrooms and also the UK colleagues were very keen on receiving our feedback to see how things are going to work. So once that was done, we started implementing the sessions in uh, the region. And uh, I will now focus more on uh, the 14 to 18, and I will leave room for my colleague Christelle to talk more about uh, 5 to 9 and 10 to the age groups 5 to 9 and 10 to 13. Now, for the group 14 to 18, as uh, maybe you are aware, the, every child who is above the age of 14 is entitled to attend the normal PDO with their parents in a classroom. And along with those 15-hour PDO sessions, uh, we have the two-hour additional uh, CO for these age groups. Now, what happens is that this, uh, these sessions are delivered in front of the parents. Parents have, their, uh, have the freedom to observe what we do during the uh, sessions for the 14 to 18, because we want to ensure that we have a lot of transparency and we want parents to hear about what we're going to talk about or what we're going to encourage children to think about. But just to add, uh, children usually prefer not to have the sessions delivered in front of their parents. 
because they feel more comfortable to talk freely to the trainers or to raise their uh, concerns to the to the trainers because sometimes they are a bit ashamed or they uh, they don't want to discuss certain topics in front of their parents now to highlight more about how we deliver the sessions um, as you know um, sessions are not delivered in an uh, in a let's say traditional classroom setup uh, what we do is we use the we use the process of inquiry approach uh, the process of inquiry is of course an educational uh, technique that uh, that is used uh, as a method of delivery it is basically more of a discovery learning uh, approach where uh, trainers can do the warm-ups and of course uh, raise stimulus within the children and all this uh, the technique is used through activities and we want children to actually think by themselves because we want to have them to start thinking critically and we don't uh, the trainer here becomes a facilitator the trainer is a guide that helps the children come up with their own questions come up with their own views and ideas and uh, give their opinion about certain topics that are raised. Uh, and through this process, they can come up with answers. They can come up with um, decisions. For just to give a highlight of one simple activity that we do, it's about social skills. Uh, because we know that children that we are dealing with come from various backgrounds and uh, they don't know much about the social skills probably in the UK. So what we want them to do is to learn more about uh, what kind of social skills they need to develop and how they need to do. And so we have an activity where we actually help children develop critical thinking about setting boundaries, giving consent to different things, having the freedom to say no if they are approached by people, and we also, through the activity, we also highlight the fact that uh, males and females, boys and girls, are considered friends in the UK. They attend classes together in the UK, and uh, they are equal to each other, and eventually they live uh, equally in a society. Uh, so basically, this approach is used because we don't want to just lecture the children. We want them to think by themselves because when they get to the UK, this is what they will have to go through. Um, apart from that, um, basically, just to highlight a bit more about why we have such one hour or two hour sessions with the children on a daily basis, because we really want to, give, to have the room or to give room for the children to have maximum retention of information and to also have time to absorb what was delivered and have to uh, or would be able to uh, think by themselves and go home and digest all that was done for them and all these activities are done in a very fun setup and uh, children really enjoy participating and for the 14 to 18 what happens is that when the sessions, when the children are attending the PDO session with their parents, they're receiving a lot of information, of course, through learner-centered approach again. And once the extra two hours are also given, it reinforces all the information that they also received while attending the 15-hour PDO themselves. Now, uh, what I will do, I will pass the microphone to my colleague, Christelle, to talk more about the uh, the two other age groups, 5 to 9 and 10 to 13, uh, and highlight the experiences of the children also in the, uh, for these two age groups. Christelle? Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. So I delivered the UK PTO for the age group 5 till 13, where in my classroom, I want children to feel at ease, to express themselves freely, to share with me anything they want. So to start in my classroom, I start with a warm up activity and to break the ice between the students, between the children and I. So we start with a small game 
Uh, it's a remembering names game where we express, them, express themselves by saying our names, uh, what, uh, what do we want to do, what do we expect in the UK. And then during the session, during the sessions, when I want to stimulate the students' critical thinking, let's say, let's say I'm talking about the education topic, I ask my children to stand up, take a look around the room. We have uh, a lot of pictures on the wall that are posted. We have a picture of uh, students in the UK in their schools. So the children here, they, uh, they stand up, take a look around the room, and while they are looking around the room on the pictures, at the pictures, I ask them questions to stimulate their thinking and their creativity. So I ask them to take a look while I'm asking them, what do you see in these pictures? Uh, what do you expect in the UK? How's the school setting? What do you see as for the technology? What do you think at what time starts the school in the UK? At what time you'll be back at home? At what time uh, you will have your lunch break or breakfast? So the students here, they have uh, time to think, and then we will discuss what do, what do they have seen already on the post. So the students will uh, have a few minutes to, to come up with a few uh, thoughts, and then they will share it with me. So my role here is not a teacher or a lecturer. I'll be a facilitator. I will guide them. I will explain any misconceptions. And at the end of each session, we have a game that is a competition game where students will answer uh, true or false questions that are also provided in the UK material book. I will ask them the questions. And at the end of uh, the competition, I will uh, share who's the winner with them. And uh, at the end of the sessions, we have um, a ticket an exit ticket where the students or the children will uh, share with me their thoughts about how was the sessions and uh, how was uh, everything with them, how did they find the sessions. And uh, can we please move to the second slide where we can see the codes that the children share with us? The second slide, please, too. Yes, so in this slide, we will go through the codes that the children have uh, shared with me in the exit ticket. So if you can please take a look at them. And if you have any question, please, can you ask us? And there is also, please, if you can move to the next slide where Talar will talk about it, the building tomorrow together. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, well, building tomorrow together was another um, activity that was uh, initiated by uh, UK colleagues basically to actually, uh, it was created to support young people waiting to be resettled as refugees in the UK. And this, uh, this basically project was, uh, it was created to help people understand that uh, children understand that there are other children that they will be going to school with that have the same probably concerns and thoughts and ideas for a better future and a better tomorrow together. And what we did between the UK and Lebanon is that we piloted this project and children were came to our classes. They expressed their opinions also through different activities like the one you see in the picture where they talk about where they see themselves or how they see the future. And through these activities, we sent the material to the UK where children uh, from the same age groups also shared, had, had shared their opinions or ideas. And they exchanged these to see that they are somewhat alike and they think alike and they all wish to have a better future probably together and how it feels like being a refugee or a refugee going to the UK and becoming uh, friends with children their age in the UK. And as you see through the quotes, just to highlight that all children sometimes have the vision of a better future together where they talk about, um, no, please, let's go to the building tomorrow together. Yes, they talk about having living in a better world they wish to see a better world and going to a school where 
teachers do not hurt them or having uh, interacting with each other in kindness and being respected and uh, living in a place where the environment is clean and people follow rules and regulations and laws and by these activities it was uh, the hi there was the, the highlight was that we wanted to reduce discrimination and you know and uh, encourage children to celebrate and respect diversity to have a positive shared uh, future with each other and uh, and think about what they can do to have a better future and how they can actually build tomorrow together and live in a better world thank you uh, we are ready for questions Gertra. Thank you very much, uh, Christel and Talar, from sharing your experience in actually working uh, with the children and the youth. And it's uh, excellent to hear how you're maybe not seeing yourself as a teacher, but rather, you know, as a facilitator, and how you're encouraging, you know, the children to to think themselves. Because um, indeed, pre-departure orientation is is not just about conveying information it's also much more about you know encouraging you know the thinking and the skills so great to hear um that um i have a question for you um as it is easier for children to learn new languages are you encouraging language skills as part of the process of inquiry when we talk about language skills, of course, you know, we need to, uh, we have a lot of children sometimes who come who have some knowledge of, uh, let's say, English, because we're now talking about the UK. Uh, but then again, there are words that are, let's say, uh, used while facilitating these sessions that children can grasp. We cannot fully focus on the language still because we want to focus on the skills as a start and the attitudes and building uh, the knowledge skills and attitudes and then the language fails phase comes along while or when they resettle but when we have children who know the language we encourage them to share words or ideas with each other and also peer teaching can help a lot over here they can teach each other let's say certain words that they know certain expressions that they know and uh, in this way, language is mildly incorporated in the, uh, let's say, during the sessions. Okay, thanks, uh, Tala. I have two questions that are perhaps a bit related, so I will ask uh, both questions, and I think it's to you, but perhaps also to, to Bindu to answer. Um, the question is, uh, do you use tablets, laptops, smartphones to facilitate activities for children? And a uh, related question to that is all of the training performed in person. Is technology used for any of the training or the follow up? Okay, um, we can answer, or if Bindu would like to uh, intervene also. Bindu? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> thank you, Talar and, and Hetra. Um, yeah, I think it's a really um, important question to, to, to dwell upon whether we're able to use technology and smartphones um, in the UKCO classroom. And it's something that we've been grappling with both for the adult um, curriculum, but also for um, children, but more so on uh, the adult curriculum. What we found is that it's not as easy to facilitate access to this. Uh, because of the limited duration within which we engage with refugees. But we're very keen to engage with technology and use technology. So I think um, it's, it's a work in progress at this point. We, we have been in contact with, with companies to try and understand. But there are a lot of um, considerations that we need to think about. One is the digital literacy of refugees themselves. And um, given the vulnerability of the cohort, I mean, I think with the MENA, we found that at least with smartphones, there's, there's a lot more um, interest and ease in using their smartphones, maybe not so much with tablets and laptops. Uh, whereas with camp-based refugees, we find that that is, uh, even smartphones are, are a far cry in terms of their access to, uh, to digital um, uh, technology and, and um, uh, ability to navigate um, the internet. That being said, 
their resettlement context is entirely technology driven. So their access to benefits or their ability to navigate um, uh, life in the UK is all driven by technology. So there is very much a need and we recognize this need. However, at this point, we do not have the infrastructure in place to actually use all of this. That doesn't mean we're not interested. It just means we are very keen to see how we can make it accessible to a wide uh, range of individuals, some who are uh, proficient to some extent with digital literacy and others who have not even got a smartphone. Yeah, me too. So you talk about indeed digital literacy, the, the lack actually of people to have access to laptops, yes. uh, tablets and so forth. Um, one of the participants is also asking, is, is there a connection issue as well? Um, I think the connection is not so much a challenge. I think in terms of infrastructure, we are able to address that. And there are different initiatives within the private sector, for sure. Um, in terms of, you know, digital classrooms or uh, classroom in a box. So those um, challenges, I think, are more easily addressed. Um, having said that, I think technology is an issue for all of us connected. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Even holding this webinar is a challenge, so. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And we're supposed to be experienced with this, yes. Yeah, exactly. Alain, would you like to also add to that, on that question? Uh, regarding laptops, smartphones, and uh, tablets, well, it's also very important, uh, putting technology aside, being active in the classroom is really important. Because children learn in such a fun way by running around the classroom, by discovering things. So having a laptop or a tablet will not facilitate that. We want children to move. We want children to discover rather than being bound to a screen. So that's why the technique used was inquiry, uh, the inquiry uh, process of inquiry, because we want them to discover themselves. And as Christelle was also explaining, in the classrooms where uh, children receive the child CO, we have a lot of colorful pictures hanging on the walls with where children have to go and discover themselves what they mean so that they can come up with questions and ideas uh, rather than just having to scroll on a tablet or a laptop. So that's why using uh, the tablets or the laptops is not preferred in this case. We would like children to be active because children have to be active basically and it really helps them to learn better. Okay, thank you, Talar. I have a few more um, questions. Um, I was wondering, is there not a risk uh, for the children or the youth of getting disillusioned once they arrive to the UK? How do you avoid children creating false expectations? Yeah, indeed, the whole question of expectation management. <laughs> Who would like to answer? Okay. <laughs> Do you want me to answer or would you like to answer? <laughs> I think if you're okay, give it a go. Uh, otherwise, I'm okay. more than happy. Why don't both of us give it a go? Now, as the pre-departure orientation programs as a whole, our whole aim is managing expectations. Uh, we're very realistic when it comes to the information delivered. And while using activities and live pictures, basically real life examples, we really want children uh, or the youth basically to discover the, the reality of life rather than just drawing a picture which does not exist. That's why we have this approach. As we go back to the inquiry uh, learning tool, basically, um, the scenarios that are given, the activities that are given, are real life experiences, basically, and how life is in the UK. We just don't want to raise expectations. We want them to discover and learn what life really is and how things happen. That is why, also for the children, we have a lot of actual pictures of things in the UK, like the library, the school, the transportation, all of that. And children were I actually able to see and experience these things and ask questions about those. And this is where the role of the trainer slash facilitator comes in. We need to facilitate to tone down their expectations. 
we need to facilitate them to, uh, for, for children to find out what the reality is rather than just having, uh, you know, imagining or drawing, let's say, fairy tales in their minds. So this is why the approach itself uh, is used to manage expectations. Bindu, would you like to add? Yeah, sure. Um, I think from our end also um, uh, continually to, to, to emphasize what, what Talar said, the effort is, is to help children understand their role as rights holders. And that's not just in a public space or at a societal level, but also in family interactions, in their relationships, understanding uh, things like consent, understanding things like uh, the way in which they can be communicated to. Um, is, is beating allowed? Is corporal punishment allowed? How, how, what is a respectful way of being communicated to? And these are all emphasized in the activities. Because like I said at the very start, one is about managing expectations, but the expectations of children are also about, like Talar said, a, a happy life, able to play. And these are all what are the rights that are enshrined in the UNCRC. These are all what are the guiding philosophy of, of leave no one behind. And particularly refugee children are a vulnerable uh, cohort with whom we find that it's very important to talk about how they are able to navigate on their own issues of consent, issues of um, um, uh, freedom of expression, the right to knowledge and information, how to use a lot of that information. Um, so when it doesn't directly answer your question, um, I wanted to emphasize that that is also a key part of, of the cultural orientation for children and young people. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think that leads us nicely to the next uh, question. It's a question for Talar and Crystal. Um, do you also touch sensitive topics like sexuality, violence, conflict between parents, harassment? And if yes, how do you manage such sensitive topics? Okay. Um, yeah, Crystal? Would you like to, yeah, go ahead. Hello again. So those sensitive topics, yes, we do talk about a few of them. When it comes to the children, there is sensitive topics that we cannot discuss with them, but there is uh, violence that we can discuss with them. We, we give the students or the children the police number, the number that they should have. So if anything happens with them, if uh, there is any discrimination even, so they can contact uh, the police or they can even tell to their parents or in case there is any emergency too, they can contact them. So that's for the children. So as for the youth, I will give it to Talar. Thank you, Krista. Well, for the youth, uh, when we're discussing social skills or relationships, yes, these topics are touched upon. Let's say talking about uh, if drug use is accepted or setting boundaries, giving consent uh to the sexual talking about a bit about sexuality or the freedom of choice so this is why also the sessions for the youth are done in front of the parents to ensure the transparency because we know that parents do have concerns uh regarding these topics but when i talked about when we were discussing about the age group 14 to 18 uh, I mentioned for a fact that sometimes children or the youth would prefer to have the sessions delivered not in front of their parents because they would have more freedom or they would feel more comfortable discussing about these issues. So we give room, it's optional sometimes for the parents to attend. So when we get the chance, let's say for parents, if they are not there and children start asking questions, again, the trainer, facilitator, guides the children to think on their own what's right and what's wrong what's accepted and what's not so and in a very subtle manner these sensitive topics are touched upon okay thank you um i i have two more questions that that you know relate to to the topics you address and how you you tackle these um i have a question how do you tackle your people's cultural differences considering these refugee youth come from various backgrounds, for example, FGM, religion, and so forth. 
And a second question, um, do you also inform them about the constraints, minimum income and minimum standards, uh, learning the language takes time, um, will also, you know, perhaps be difficult for them to, to catch up with their peers when it comes to education. Do you also deal with these uh, constraints and how do you handle these cultural differences? Okay, um, handling the cultural differences now, um, again, through the activities that we have in the children's manuals uh, for the different age groups, uh, a lot about the culture, the UK culture is covered, for example. And we also discuss about, you know, Christelle also mentioned that uh, we talk about discrimination and how wrong it is to be discriminating people. And, uh, Again, through the activities and through, you know, we have a character that we use and children identify themselves through this character and talk about uh, a refugee character who was resettled to the UK just like themselves and what he went through. So it's about feelings and emotions and how things must be done and what's right and what's wrong. So it's all guided and um, we know for a, fact, for a fact that sometimes there will be difficulties adjusting to the new culture, but using the youth uh, CO or the child CO, we, we use it as a plot. We, we use it as a platform for just to prepare the children about what's expecting them there. You know, to give them a highlight, and we know that sometimes it's not an easy ride. But we tackle these issues step by step. You know, we just plant the seeds and expect that eventually those seeds will grow and children will be able to adapt. Children are resilient at the end of the day. So it will be uh, easier sometimes for them to integrate. Uh, now, regarding religion and uh, the different backgrounds, we know that the UK is a very diverse country. So religion, uh, all kinds of religions exist over there and there's freedom of belief and there's freedom for people to practice their religions and practice their cultures. So that is also highlighted uh, during these sessions. I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Crystal. And perhaps this also goes back, and Tala, of course, this also goes back to um, why we feel it's important to have, you know, the, the pre-departure orientation delivered by cross-cultural facilitators rather than yes. UK trainers, because they, you know, would be better placed to, to understand and, and address these cultural um, differences. Now I will combine the last um, questions. Um, there are a few questions that relate more to perhaps, you know, some of the modalities in which you deliver um, this youth PDO. Um, if we understand correctly, um, the youth are also attending the normal um, PDO. Now, if they attend the normal PDO sessions for five hours a day and after that, they still have, you know, extra hours um, for the youth uh, specific PDO, um, how do they deal with these, you know, long hours? Um, isn't it um, too much for them, basically? That's the first question. And then there is also a question related to siblings. If you have siblings from the same family, would you have them in the same group or in a different group? Um, and then finally, also a question related to um, remote delivery of PDO. Indeed, now in these times of COVID-19, it's perhaps uh, not always or not everywhere possible to have you know, people in a classroom. Um, can we consider um, remote PDO through webinars or other you know, virtual formats and are there any you know recommendations that you um, would make on that to at least you know make it a, an interactive learning experience okay um i will start from the long hours of uh, PDO <laughs> for the youth now as mentioned earlier yes the youth 14 to 18 do attend the 15 hour pdo with their parents because uh all our PDOs are delivered to all, all children or everyone above the age of 14. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, because our sessions are very learner-centered, uh, it's quite fun to be in the classroom, let's say, because there's a lot of interaction. 
And of course, we do not have the six hours in one go. We have different breaks, icebreakers, energizers, just to you know change the mood in the classroom. And the extra hours for the youth when they are delivered, um, it's incorporated somehow with the adult PDO. You know, uh, it reinforces the messages and also helps with the skills. So children, it's, children are usually happy to attend those. Then we're talking out of experience. Um, they're happy to, to receive the extra information or to participate in the extra activities because they are really acquiring a lot of knowledge from there and they are enhancing their skills and their knowledge and their critical thinking. And uh, so that is why we do not believe that it's, it's very long because they're completely separate from each other, you know? And by giving these little breaks, uh, they have enough time to absorb and reinforce the other messages that were also delivered for during the adult CO sessions. This is in a nutshell. <laughs> yes, thank you. And for the siblings, for would the you play the same role? Uh, for the youth, if the if the if there are siblings within the ages of 14 to 18, well, they have to be in the same room. Uh, it all dep depends on the age groups. The age, yeah. You know? Yes. yes. Uh, if I have two siblings in the age of within the ages of five to nine or ten to thirteen, well, they have to be in the same room because their parents are also attending the PDO at the same time. But while doing the activities, and Crystal can assist me over here, uh, when we, we try to yes, have. When we have siblings in the age of uh, 5 to 13, we try to work in pair with someone else or we try to have a group work. So the two siblings won't be in the same group, but they will be attending the, in the same classroom, but they will be working in different groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> good. Thanks. And uh, finally, perhaps on, on the remote video, indeed, maybe to, to share with our participants that we as IOM have also been uh, reflecting upon that prompted by you know the COVID-19 uh, pandemic we also have been doing some thinking well um, as Talar already explained for us the preference is still to have you know a classroom PDO because of the interaction it can um, create um, if really this is not an option um, we do would consider you know remote PDO um, better than no PDO um, at all whether this is then done, you know, through, through internet or through telephone, um, that depends all on, on the situation and, of course, also the, the, the digital literacy skills um, of uh, the beneficiaries. Uh, but it's not our preferred option. It would be, you know, a scenario where it is not possible or we would look actually at blended learning models where we could perhaps have smaller groups in the classroom to respect social distancing and at the same time follow up, you know, with remote um, PDO, telephonic or online um, to reinforce um, some of the messages. So we are um, exploring that and perhaps, you know, uh, COVID-19 is now even, you know, um, a motivation for us to innovate. Let us um, put it like that. There is one last question I will ask you to address and then we really have to move on to the commit um, handbook. Um, this question uh, relates to um, how you deal with the tension between the parents and the sensitive information delivered in the youth uh, PDO. Uh, things such as uh, sexual education, dating, sexuality, for some regions this is a very sensitive matter. So how do you deal then with, with perhaps possible tension with, with the parents on, on such um, topics? <laughs> okay. It's a good um, question. It's a very good question. It's, uh, it's not an easy question. Um, basically, uh, these topics are already covered for the parents also. You know, when we're discussing cultures, when we're discussing uh, laws, rules, regulations, well, we have different activities that also uh, highlight these points to the parents. And we do not expect everyone just to change overnight. But parents also need to, uh, let's say, um, understand that they have to respect uh, certain cultures or certain, uh, let's say, uh, sexual orientation, the sexual education. 
we try to explain, we try to, of, of course, through activities and everything, we try to explain that this is the culture that they are going to, and they will have to uh, respect the law or the culture that exists in the country, because they are going to be also become a part of that society. And if they do not respect, it's considered discrimination, you know, and, um, and we don't want anyone to be discriminated. Uh, so these topics are also discussed during the adult PDO and the, when, while the children are also present. So when we touch upon these points or these topics while the living, delivering the youth PDO, it's already covered somehow uh, during the adult PDO. So it makes it a little easier to, to approach these topics. It's never 100% easy because we always have people who actually object or uh let's say refuse to listen or refuse to believe but we do our best to deliver the mm -hmm. messages and let them decide on how they will be eventually um uh, accept or not we cannot change everyone we're not thank there you. to change everyone basically. <laughs> yes thank you so much uh Talang, for uh, sharing your experience and there were a lot of questions from the participants um so I'm sure it's a topic that generates a lot of uh, interest. So thank you, Christelle Talar. Um, perhaps the last note also to say that, of course, when we talk about delivery uh, methods, uh, whether you know, we would consider remote PDO delivery, uh, whether there is youth PDO and so forth, also depends on, on a decision, of course, um, made by uh, the respective um, member states. So um, IOM is, of course, always in discussion with the member states. And um, uh, there will be, if I understand well, even a, a meeting today with EASO where uh, the discussion of um, PDO delivery in times of COVID-19 is also on the agenda. Now with this, uh, I would like to move on to the very last uh, session of our webinar, uh, where we're going to and tell you a bit more about the manual, the trainer's handbook. Uh, we produced uh, training refugee youth. Um, this handbook is based precisely on experiences such as the one of IOM uh, UK. And our colleague Anna Giustiniani, who's the project manager of the commit project, uh, will now tell you a bit more about this handbook. Anna, please, you have the floor. Thank you. thank you, Gertra, and thank you very much uh, for, to all participants for the very interesting points raised so far. Uh, so we are approaching the end of today's webinar and we wanted to present to you uh, one of the deliverables of the COMMIT project. Uh, you see here the front page. Um, I know um, my colleague Rabab has already shared the link to uh, um, download this, so um, we, we're really uh, hoping that you will be able to uh, go through this document uh, very soon. So today we wanted to share with you uh, the process that brought us here. Um, next slide, thank you, Rabab. So we basically started from assessing the needs of the target group. And how did we do this? We reached out the PDO trainers to gather their inputs on the needs and challenges that uh, refugees, uh, young refugees, were expressing during um, the PDO session, so at pre-departure stage. And we tried to match them with the needs and concerns uh, they expressed once resettled in Europe. We did this uh, uh, in particular through monitoring exercises that we have been conducting in, in Europe, in Italy and, and in Portugal, especially in the last few years, uh, where we go and visit uh, resettled refugees to understand what their experience was, what they found uh, um, the PDO, the pre-departure orientation sessions were useful for, and we collect their needs and, and concerns. What we did next was to discuss uh, um, at a regional uh, event last year, now uh, one year passed from uh, the regional event in Lisbon, uh, together with IOM experts, national stakeholders, uh, we discussed the uh, relevant contents to be um, included in the, um, in the manual. We, of course, looked at the uh, 
uh, curricula developed by more experienced countries, uh, as Bindu explained also, um, this was the process they underwent also for developing the UK uh, curriculum. We looked specifically at Australia, Canada and, and the UK, which has just been presented by our colleagues. Uh, so this leads us to the next slide. Um, this handbook was not meant to be related to any specific country, but was uh, rather um, um, intended to include um, relevant contents for the target group. Uh, you will see uh, this uh, when, when uh, uh, looking at the, at the manual. Uh, contents that were able to address the concerns and needs that we had assessed, uh, as I explained before. We build this tool by following the IOM's approach, um, that is to say, a learner-centered approach, a participatory one, and one that conducive to an interactive space, as our colleagues from Lebanon has uh, uh, mentioned um, multiple times. A tool that was uh, easily adaptable and replicable to different contexts. Next slide, please. Um, as you will hopefully see, the handbook is made of nine different sections, each devoted to specific issues, with all of sharing with you those that emerge clearly at both hands of the resettlement continuum pre and post departure. And we are happy to see that these issues was also, were also the ones uh, just raised by your questions. So we look at uh, uh, socializing, um, how to build uh, friendship and, and relations, uh, we try uh, to look at the fears and concerns that uh, um, young refugees have expressed and how to best accompany them, as colleagues have explained, in this, uh, in this process of the adaptation. We look at discrimination, we look at uh, peer pressure, the pressure that uh, um, young refugees can be subject to, both from their peers and from their families. Um, this links to the um, next topic, which is the family dynamics and cultural identity, the difficulties that both parents and uh, children go through when uh, uh, experiencing changes in family dynamics from their country of origin to their countries of first asylum and, and then to the country of the resettlement. Uh, issues like freedom of religion and expression, issues like consent, as was mentioned uh, multiple times by our colleagues. So to conclude, um, um, next slide, please. We wanted to share with you some suggestions on how to possibly further use this tool. As mentioned, this can be easily adapted to any national context. It is addressed to young refugees, but content is relevant also for their parents, as we've just seen for the case of the UK culture orientation. For this handbook to be transferred into national PDO curriculum, stakeholders in the countries of uh, resettlement should work with trainers to adapt it and should collect inputs by refugees themselves. Um, we like, in fact, to conclude with this uh, recommendation as one of the underlining principles of our work um, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, field, in which we actively involve, uh, involve refugees in the development of the information material, as well as in the information uh, sessions and addressing them, as they are, in fact, uh, at the center of the whole process. So I would like to finish with this, uh, uh, with this remark and invite you all to uh, visit the, the link that we have shared with you. And uh, we hope that uh, this, uh, this is only the presentation of this, um, of this um, guideline, of this set of guidelines, but we really hope that uh, we will have the chance to discuss perhaps in a few months, its actual implementation. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna, indeed, for uh, sharing a bit more information about this new uh, COMMIT handbook on training refugee youth. Indeed, we would like to encourage all of you to check it out. So, uh, Rabab shared in the chat already the link to our website where you can find the handbook. It's also been shared on our Twitter account. Please feel free to retweet and uh, share this handbook even uh, more widely amongst um, your networks. Um, and of course, uh, as Anna said, it's something that can be adapted to, to many different uh, national 
context um, perhaps it can also you know be useful at the post arrival stage as we're trying to reinforce certain messages that were given pre departure also at the post arrival could be relevant as well in context of uh, relocation of unaccompanied minors so uh, basically it's something we like to share with you encourage you to use and definitely uh, we would also be grateful for any feedback you have if you do use the handbook please let us know um, what you think uh, any feedback is um, appreciated um, so with this i think we are coming to the end of our webinar i would like to thank um, all the speakers uh, lawrence uh, bindu crystal talar anna for your contributions it was excellent um, also, I would like to thank all the participants for the many questions you've asked. I think this really shows it is definitely a topic um, we are all looking to explore further. And finally, to say that we'll of course share with all of you um, the recording of the webinar uh, so you can watch it again. We can also share the presentation, of course. Um, and uh, we would be happy to meet you again in our next uh, COMMIT webinar for which uh, you will receive an invitation in due course. So with this, um, I wish you an excellent afternoon and we hope to stay in touch. Bye bye.